గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ వ్యూవర్స్ అండ్ ఆస్పిరెంట్స్ వెల్కమ్ టు ది హిందీ న్యూస్ అనాలిసిస్ బ్రాట్ యూ బై శంకర్ ఐస్ అకాడమీ టుడే విల్ బీ కవరింగ్ ది హిందీ న్యూస్ ఎడిషన్ డేటెడ్ ట్వంటీ నైన్త్ ఆఫ్ మార్చ్ టూ థౌసండ్ ట్వంటీ టూ దీస్ ఆర్ ది ఆర్టికల్స్ ఐ హ్ చూసన్ ఫర్ టుడేస్ డిస్కషన్ నౌ వితౌట్ వేస్టింగ్ మచ్ టైమ్ లెట్ ఎస్ గెట్ టు ది డిస్కషన్ నౌ సో నౌ లెట్ ఎస్ టేక్ అప్ దిస్ న్యూస్ ఆర్టికల్ ఇట్ ఈస్ అ ఫ్రంట్ పేజ్ ఆర్టికల్ విచ్ టాక్స్ అబౌట్ ది క్రిమినల్ ప్రొసీజర్ ఐడెంటిఫికేషన్ బిల్ ఆఫ్ టూ థౌసండ్ ట్వంటీ టూ See, this bill is in news because yesterday it was introduced in Lok Sabha. And when it was introduced, the opposition demanded division of votes regarding the bill. And the opposition also said that the bill is unconstitutional and it violates the fundamental rights of citizens. So, it becomes important for us to know about the important provisions of the bill from exam perspective. Let us see that today. And here I have given you the syllabus so that you can know how relevant this topic is for our preparation. Now, first... What is the purpose of this bill? Any bill has a purpose, right? See, this bill has been enacted to authorize for taking measurements of convicts and other persons. Now, these measurements are taken for identification of the convicts in the criminal matters. And such measurements will also help with the investigation in criminal matters. Plus, it will be taken so as it could be preserved as a record. So, for these purposes, the bill authorizes for taking measurements. measurements of convicts and other persons now you would have heard that normally if a person is convicted her or his uh, measurements are taken actually currently it is being done based on the identification of prisoners act of 1920 see this act was the one that authorizes the taking of measurements and photographs of convicts and others and as per the 1920 act measurements include finger impressions that is fingerprints and footprint impressions So in the same way now the 2022 bill also authorizes to take measurements of convicts and other persons so therefore if this bill becomes an act then it will repeal the 1920 act which is the identification of prisoners act now here you may think that taking measurements of convicts is justified to a level but what about other persons can government take measurements of every citizen citing the reason of investigation actually it is not so for this the bill prescribes who all are are required to give measurements see as per the bill three kinds of individuals are required to give measurements first is the person who has been convicted for any offense punishable under any law in force this is the person who we call it as the convicted person okay now the second kind of person is the one who has been ordered to give security for his good behavior or for maintaining peace and he or she or he has been ordered so under section 117 of crpc that is code of criminal procedure 1973 and this security is taken for proceedings under other sections of the crpc but what is security here it refers to furnishing guarantee to the satisfaction of the court and this guarantee will be in a manner like you know a certain conduct is mandatory and this mandatory conduct has to be maintained for a certain period by a certain person concerning a certain thing and this procedure of furnishing the guarantee takes place in the shape of a bond and this bond is to be executed by such a person from whom the security is demanded and note that such a bond may occur with sureties or even without sureties so it is just a guarantee provided by the person from whom the security is demanded so if a person has been ordered to give security under section 117 of crpc then measurements of that person shall be taken along with this the person who has been arrested in connection with an offence punishable under any law for the time being in force should also give his or her measurements along with this a person who is detained under any preventive detention law is also required to do so so all these kinds of persons have to give measurements under this bill but who will take those measurements it will be taken by the police officer or a prison officer in such a manner as prescribed by the central government or the state government but there is a major difference between what we can call measurements under the 1920 act and this 2022 bill because i said that under the 1920 act the measurements included the fingerprint and footprint impressions but measurements under this new bill covers a wide range of measurements for example it includes finger impressions palm print impressions footprint impressions photographs iris and retina scan then physical biological samples along with their analysis then it also includes the behavioral attributes such as uh, signatures handwriting plus the measurements 
assignments also include any other examination referred in section 53 or 53a of crpc so what is the section 53 or uh, 53a c section 53 deals with examination of accused by medical practitioner at the request of police officer now let us not go into the details of this section but just know that under this section examination will include examination of blood blood stains semen swabs in case of uh, sexual offenses then sputum and sweat hair samples and fingernail clippings etc and the section 53a deals with examination of person who is accused of rape by medical practitioner so this examination also includes you know as i said the, the semen sample swab hair samples etc so all these have been brought under the ambit of measurements under this particular bill but who can order to take such measurements or to ask a person to give this measurement the authority lies with the magistrate and if the magistrate is satisfied that for the purpose of any investigation or for the proceeding under the crpc or for proceeding under any law the measurement is required then the magistrate shall direct that person to give measurements but can we resist or refuse to give measurement actually the bill also deals with this kind of provision that is if any person resists or refuses to allow the taking of such measurements then it is lawful for the police officer or the prison officer to take such measurements that is they can still take your measurements and as per the bill such a resistance or refusal will amount to penal actions under section 186 of indian penal code actually you'd have heard about this section in many movies you would have heard about the term obstruction of justice right and this section deals with that particularly the section 186 deals with obstructing public servant in discharge of public functions so if there is such obstruction then that person can be punished with imprisonment for a term up to 3 months so if you have been ordered by the magistrate to give your uh, measurements and you refuse it then it will be obstruction of justice under section 186 of indian penal code So so far we saw about the purposes of the bill then what measurements should be taken who will take it and who has the authority to order that now let us see what will happen once the measurements are taken see as per the bill the measurements will be under the administration of the national crime records bureau it has the authority to collect store preserve the measurements it will also share disseminate destruct and dispose the records of those measurements particularly it will collect the record of measurements from state government or union territory administration or any other law enforcement agencies it will also store preserve and destroy the record of measurement at national level then it will also process the records with relevant crime and criminal records along with that whenever necessary it will share and disseminate the records with any law enforcement agency but for how long such a measurement will be stored as a record as per the bill the record will be retained in a digital format or in an electronic form for a period of 75 years from the date of collection now here after that the records will be destroyed but can the records be destroyed before the end of 75 years yes actually but it is under certain circumstances like you know if any person who has not been previously convicted of an offense is released without trial or is discharged or is acquitted by the court after exhausting all legal remedies then the record of measurements of such person may be destroyed see why this provision is important because when we saw that whose measurements can be taken we saw that a person who is arrested in connection of an offense will be asked to give his or her measurements but if you are discharged without any charges that is if you are acquitted then there is no meaning in keeping your records so at that time the measurements have to be destroyed so overall what you have to remember is the criminal procedure identification bill provides for legal sanction for taking appropriate body measurements and behavioral attributes of persons who are required to give such measurements the purpose behind it is to make the investigation of crime more efficient and expeditious and it is expected that this will help in increasing the conviction rate but i said in the beginning that opposition has called this bill as unconstitutional because it violates fundamental rights now today we are not going to cover this aspect we'll be covering this in the coming days along with the editorial discussions so just to today you have an idea about what this act is about and what are all the important provisions so what is the purpose of the act it is to authorize the collection of measurements from the convicts as well as from other persons 
and here measurements will include fingerprint footprint impressions your uh, retinal scan your handwriting signature etc etc then here other persons would include those persons who has been asked to give security under section 117 of crpc and it also includes those persons who have been arrested for any offence or those persons who have been detained under preventive detention provision then the measurements can be taken by a police officer or a prison officer as per the rules or regulations of central government or state government then we saw that the magistrate has the authority to order such taking of measurements then resisting or refusing to give measurements will amount to punishment under ipc then we saw that after the measurements are taken it will be stored and preserved and disseminated whenever required by the ncrb that is national crime records bureau then it will be preserved or stored for a period of 75 years but before that also it can be destroyed under the circumstances when you know if a person who has not been previously convicted is released from a trial or when that person is acquitted without any charges then in such a scenario the records will be destroyed so these are few points that you have to remember about this bill now let us get to the next discussion so now let us take up this news article As you can see here it mentions that a city in Kerala is contending to become the UNESCO city of literature. See this city of literature tag is given by UNESCO under its Creative Cities Network. So taking this opportunity let us understand and revise what is Creative Cities Network then we'll see the news. Let us begin with the understanding of Creative Cities Network. So it is a UNESCO international program for cities. This is a network created by UNESCO in 2004 and its main objective is to promote the cooperation among the cities that have identified creativity as a strategic factor or a main factor for sustainable urban development. And along with this, these are all the other objectives of Creative Cities Network. Just go through it. So in this way the creative cities network acts as a ground of action and innovation especially for the implementation of 2030 agenda for sustainable development so which is the goal that is related to cities it is goal number 11 sustainable cities and communities it aims to make cities and human settlements more inclusive safe resilient and sustainable And under this target 11.4 is to strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. But we cannot confine the Creative Cities Network uh, objective into just this one goal and uh, target of SDG. Rather it also comes under many other goals. For example, the cities of literature, they aim to ensure freedom of expression and literacy for all. So it is in line with SDG 4 that deals with quality education. Like that, we can link all of the categories with certain goals and targets. Now, here note that as per UNESCO, 246 cities around the world are part of this network, and all these cities work together towards a common objective at the local level and international level. Now, at the local level, the objective is to place or to have the creativity and cultural industries at the heart of development plans. That is the urban development plans, and at the international level, these cities will cooperate actively for the same purpose. So by joining this network the cities commit to sharing their best practices and they also commit to develop partnerships which will involve the public and private sectors as well as the participation of civil society. Now we know that creativity is present in all the fields but this creative cities network majorly covers seven creative fields. They are the fields of crafts and folk art, media arts, film design gastronomy literature and music so these are the seven creative fields under creative cities network remember this here you should also note that every year there is also a world cities day it is celebrated on 31st of october and the general theme of this world cities day is better city better life so now coming to india which are all the cities under this network from india so we have six cities under it as of now under various categories For example, we have the city of Varanasi under the music category and uh, Jaipur under the category of crafts and folk arts. They received this recognition in 2015. Then uh, Chennai became the creative city of music in 2017 and if you remember in 2019 Hyderabad became part of Creative Cities Network in the gastronomy category. And then in the same year Mumbai was designated as a creative city in the film category. And very recently last year in 2021 Srinagar was recognized as the creative city of crafts and folk art. 
So these are the six cities: Chennai, Varanasi, Jaipur, Hyderabad, Mumbai, and Srinagar. And remember, under the crafts and folk arts category, we have two cities: one is Jaipur, and the other is Srinagar. And under the category of music, also we have two cities: they are Varanasi and Chennai. So from this, you would have understood that there are three remaining categories under which no other city from India has been designated so far. These are the categories of literature, designs, and then the media arts category. But now the news is that under the literature category, a city from Kerala is being proposed to the UNESCO for this tag. See here, we are talking about the Kori Kodu city from Kerala. See, this city is known for its rich literary works. and has a legacy of writers such as vaikam mohammad bashir sanjay n sk potticard mt vasudevan nair etc and if you see from the asian pacific region there are only seven cities so far in the literature category so if kolkata city gets this tag then it will become eight and as you can see here lahore is one of those cities Now, along with Kori Kod, few other cities are contending from Kerala under various categories. For example, the city of Kochi is aiming for the city of design. Then, uh, the city of Kannur is vying for the recognition as city of crafts and folk arts, etc. So, we'll see the specialty of each of these cities once they get the recognition from UNESCO. Today, we are ending this discussion with this. Remember that the Creative Cities Network belongs to UNESCO. The main aim of this network is to promote cooperation among cities that has creativity as a strategic factor for sustainable urban development and so far 246 cities around the globe are part of this network and there are seven fields under this crafts and folk arts media arts film design gastronomy literature and then music and from india six cities have got recognition so far two in the music category they are varanasi and chennai then two in the crafts and folk arts category they are jaipur and srinagar and then one in the gastronomy category it is the city of hyderabad and then one in the category of film it is the city of mumbai so these are the facts you have to remember from this discussion let us get to the next one so now let us take up this editorial article for discussion what is it about it is about the regional organization beamstech See Bimstech is in news because the 5th Bimstech summit will happen tomorrow that is on 30th March and Indian Prime Minister will be attending this summit it is going to be a virtual mood summit and it is hosted by Sri Lanka because it is the current Bimstech chair now according to the author this upcoming summit is an opportunity for Bimstech leaders to go beyond generalized statements and to take concrete steps to address critical challenges that is confronting the bay of bengal region So that is why in this regard author has discussed about the significance of Bimstech especially about the Bay of Bengal and the challenges faced by the region and the author has also suggested certain solutions to address the issues we'll see all these today and before that this is the syllabus that is relevant to the discussion and take note that this discussion will be important from prelims as well as mains perspective because we'll be seeing certain facts about Bimstech and Bay of Bengal also let us start the discussion now See so first Beamstech stands for the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation it is a long name i know now this Beamstech is a regional organization it came into being in the year 1997 through the Bangkok declaration now this organization comprises of seven member states and these member states are the states lying in the littoral areas and adjacent areas of Bay of Bengal and five of these states are from south asia and two from southeast asia the five south asian members are bangladesh bhutan india nepal and sri lanka and the two southeast asian members are myanmar and thailand so in this way it could also be called as a sub regional organization now here you should remember that initially bimstech was envisaged as an economic block with four member states only so at that time it had the acronym bastec and here bast stood for bangladesh india sri lanka and thailand and ec represented economic cooperation but later only myanmar nepal and bhutan joined the grouping and this led to the change in the name of the grouping to the bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation so remember before b stood for bangladesh but now b stands for bay of bengal don't get confused so now what makes beamstech special 
So this regional group that is Bimstek constitutes a bridge between South Asia and Southeast Asia as we just saw and it also has established a platform for intra-regional cooperation between SARC members and ASEAN members. Along with that the Bimstek region is home to around 1.5 billion people. So they constitute around 22% of the global population and together they have a combined gross domestic product of 2.7 trillion economy. Particularly note that in the last five years, Bimstek member states have been able to sustain an average 6.5 percentage economic growth trajectory despite global financial meltdown. So from this you should understand that the basic objective of building this alliance was to harness the shared and accelerated growth through mutual cooperation in different areas of common interests. So in this regard, Beamstech is a sector-driven cooperative organization and each country in the Beamstech leads different sectors. For example, as you can see here, India leads the security sector. And this has the subsector of counter-terrorism and transnational crime, disaster management and energy. So this was the basics that you need to know about Beamstech. Now let us come to the importance of Bay of Bengal and the challenges faced by it. And through that, we'll see the relevance of Beamstech. So basically, Bay of Bengal is home to large network of beautiful estuaries, mangrove forests, coral reefs, seagrass meadows, and it also holds mass nesting sites of sea turtles. So from the biodiversity perspective, Bay of Bengal holds significance. Plus, the bay is an important source of natural resources for the coastal population of approximately 185 million people, that is 18.5 crore people. And among them, the fishermen population alone is around 3.7 million and they contribute to an annual fish catch of around 6 million tons. Now, the 6 million tons is about 7% of world's catch and it is valued at 4 billion US dollars. Plus, around 4 lakh fishing boats operate in the Bay of Bengal. So, economically also, Bay of Bengal is quite important. So, from the side of uh, marine ecology and fishery sector, Bay of Bengal holds significance. But there are certain challenges faced by the Bay of Bengal. And the most pressing of them is the emergence of dead zone in the Bay of Bengal. So, what is a dead zone? It is a common term for hypoxia. Hypoxia means reduced level of oxygen and this hypoxia occurs in the water. Now in a region where there is reduced level of oxygen in the water, here most marine life either dies or if that marine life is mobile, then they leave the area. Now since the marine life dies in such a region, it is called as dead zone. So dead zone has zero oxygen where no fish survives. Now here you should note that such hypoxic zones or dead zones can occur naturally. But scientists are also concerned about the areas that are created or enhanced by human activity. It is because there are many physical factors, chemical and biological factors that combine to create dead zones. And among them, nutrient pollution is the primary cause of dead zones created by humans. So how this nutrient pollution happens? It happens due to the excess nutrients runoff from the land or the runoffs of wastewater into the rivers and coasts. All these stimulate an overgrowth of algae and this algae sinks and decomposes in the water. Now this decomposition consumes oxygen and it depletes the supply of oxygen which is available to the healthy marine life and that is why it becomes a dead zone. So dead zone is a major problem in Bay of Bengal. Along with this leaching of plastic from rivers and from the Indian Ocean is also another reason. Then destruction of natural protection against floods such as destruction of mangroves and coral reefs is another reason. See, actually, the annual loss of mangrove areas is estimated at 0.4% to 1.7% and the loss of coral reefs is at the rate of 0.7%. And we know that there is a prediction of uh, sea level rise of 0.5 meters in the next 50 years. So this will increase the dangers along these coastal regions. And moreover, already we have witnessed many cyclonic storms that have originated from Bay of Bengal in the last five years. And these happened mainly due to the destruction of natural protection like uh, mangroves and coral reefs. Along with this, sea erosion is a problem, growing population pressure is a problem and industrial growth is a problem. Along with this, huge quantities of uh, untreated waste flow into the ocean is also a problem. So these are the ecological issues. Now there are also certain security threats in the Bay of Bengal region such as terrorism and piracy. 
Plus, in the recent times, we also have tensions between countries that are caused by arrests of fishermen who cross maritime boundaries. So, these also contribute to additional problems in the Bay of Bengal region. Now, to address all these challenges, the answer lies in the regional integration of the region. Why regional integration? It is because the blue economy potential of Bay of Bengal is huge. What is blue economy? It is the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, while at the same time preserving the health of the ocean ecosystem. So the blue economy potential of Bay of Bengal is huge and that is why Bay of Bengal provides many opportunities to develop maritime trade, shipping, aquaculture and tourism. So tapping these opportunities requires coordinated and concerted action by the government, scientists and other experts. And this is where the Beamstech and the upcoming Beamstech Summit hold significance because according to the author, the Beamstech Summit must create a new regional mechanism for coordinated activities on maritime issues of transboundary nature. See, this new regional mechanism, according to the author, must initiate urgent measures to strengthen fisheries management. Along with that, it should also promote sustainable fishing methods. It should establish protected areas and it should develop frameworks to prevent and manage pollution, especially pollution due to industrial and agricultural waste and oil spills. Along with this, the mechanism will also promote greater scientific research on the impact of climate change in general and on fisheries in particular. Now, author is saying this because at present there is limited cooperation between the countries of the region in the maritime research. See, most Bimstick countries are premier institutions and excellent scientists, but their interaction within the region is far less if you compare with what they have with the western region. And if there will be more interaction, then there will be improved use of modern technology and there will be improved fishing practices that could be shared among these countries and they could work together in restoring the health of the Bay of Bengal. So basically regional integration is the answer for all the issues according to the author. But what can be done by the Beamstick countries for regional integration? What they have to do? See primarily the countries must prioritize certain areas for achieving regional integration. Let us see what constitute those certain areas. First, marine environmental protection must become a priority area for cooperation. Along with this, enforcement mechanism must be strengthened and information should be shared on best practices. Then most importantly, decision making must be based on science and reliable data. And there is also need for homegrown solutions based on the capabilities of local institutions. And this should give birth to mutual learning through regional success stories. So in this way, Beamstick must promote sustainable fishing. Now, if we talk about the upcoming uh, Beamstick Summit, according to the author, it must mandate officials to come up with measures to curtail unsustainable as well as IUU fishing. What is IUU fishing? It stands for illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. So, unsustainable fishing along with IUU fishing must be curtailed and for this, the Beamstick countries could set up an international vessel tracking system and they could make it mandatory for vessels to be equipped with automatic identification system trackers. Then the summit should also establish a regional fishing vessel registry system and it should publish vessel license lists to help identify legal vessels. Then proper information sharing is necessary and for that the summit must enable regular meeting of officials supported by scientists and experts so that they can tackle illegal and unsustainable fishing. So by taking all these measures we can aim to prevent the environmental degradation of Bay of Bengal. So the conclusion is Beamstick must arise, awake and act before it is too late. So that is all. In this discussion we saw about Beamstick, why is it important? Then we saw about Bay of Bengal, its significance, then the issues in the Bay of Bengal. And finally, we saw that those issues could be resolved with the use of regional integration of the Beamstick countries. And uh, we also saw what should be done to achieve regional integration. With these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So now let us take up this news article. It talks about a bill passed by the Lok Sabha. Now, this bill aims to amend the list of scheduled tribes of Tripura. This bill is called the Constitution Scheduled Tribes Order Second Amendment Bill of 2022. And this amendment aims to include the Darlang community as a sub-tribe of the Kuki tribe in the list of scheduled tribes of Tripura. So, that is why today we are going to cover a few facts about the Darlang community and we will also see the procedure to amend the scheduled tribes list. 
and this is the syllabus relevant to this discussion but before going into the discussion i would like to say that there are going to be many terms in the discussion that i am unfamiliar with so there may be mispronunciations also so i apologize in advance so let us start the discussion now see the darlangs of tripura they belong to one among the many communities of the zomi see here zomi is the name of the major tribe that is found in various parts of south and southeast asia they are a tribe of larger ethnic group which the britishers called with many names they called them as chin in myanmar they called them as kuki in manipur and they were called as lushai in mizoram and this is the reason why this ethnic group is also known as kuki chin group and note that in burma that is in the present day myanmar zomis are found to have been uh, geographically located in tonsang district the tedem district the somra tracks the kamti district and the kel kabau valley and particularly in india the tribe is concentrated in the northeast of mizoram the naga hills and the north kachar hills and the karbi anglong districts of assam now note that the close ethnicity of this tribal group is proved by the peculiarity that though there are variations in dialects of the language they speak but still the zomi can converse with one another in their respective dialects with 70% comprehension or understanding and this is unlike any other tribe and also the zo people have a common uh, primordial name they have common history common cultural affinities belief systems economic life and they also have a common dream of restoring their glorious past so as a result their relationship is bound not just by geographical boundaries but also by racial unity so in this manner the darlongs are one of the communities in the zomi major tribe and note that darlong is another tribe that is known as kukis see some sources say that kuki is a word that is used by outside people to refer groups of tribes like darlong and lushai so it seems like kuki is a general term so this is the reason why now the government is aiming to include darlong tribe as a sub tribe under the kuki community now coming to the darlong tribe particularly it has two sub tribes they are amroy and fatlei The Amroy tribe is concentrated in Unakuti and uh, North district of Tripura and the Fatlei tribe is concentrated in the village called Kalaigiri it is located in the Unakuti district in the present state of Tripura but note that except for the state of Tripura in India the existence of Darlongs in some other location is a mystery now coming to their economic activities note that they majorly indulge in jhum cultivation that is the slash and burn cultivation and they also undertake hunting and fishing for their livelihood so these are few facts that you need to know about darlong community now let us come to the procedure to amend the scheduled tribes list so basically as you know to realize the objectives of equality and justice as laid down in the preamble the constitution made special provisions for the scheduled caste scheduled tribes backward classes and the anglo indians and these provisions are contained in part 16 of the constitution under articles 332 342a and these articles are related to reservation in legislatures special representation in legislatures educational grants etc and particularly if you talk about scheduled tribes here the constitution does not specify the castes or the tribes which are to be called as scheduled castes or scheduled tribes rather it leaves it to the president the power to specify any caste or tribe in each state and union territory to be treated as scheduled caste and scheduled tribe therefore the list of scheduled tribes or scheduled castes vary from state to state and the union territory to union territory and in case of the states the president issues the notification of the list of scheduled tribes after consulting the governor of the state but note that any inclusion or exclusion of any caste or tribe from the presidential notification can be done only by the parliament and it could not be done by a subsequent presidential notification so several orders have been issued specifying the scheduled tribes and scheduled castes in different states and union territories and they have been also amended by the parliament after that so what are all the constitutional provisions regarding these procedures here you have to remember article 342 because this article is the one that empowers the president to specify the scheduled tribes in various states and union territories 
Now the order that is made by the president specifying the scheduled tribes is called as the Constitution Scheduled Tribes Order and initially it was uh, notified in the year 1950. So currently the bill, the 2022 bill aims to amend this Constitution Scheduled Tribes Order of 1950 only and this order is as per clause 1 of article 342. So remember these facts regarding the amending of list of scheduled tribes in a state now let us get to the next discussion so our last discussion for the day is going to be based on this news article it mentions that india is about to sign a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with united arab emirates that is uae and with the signing of this agreement the german jewelry export promotion council has said that india's german jewelry sector would achieve annual exports of more than 10 billion dollars to the uae so it is said that india's uh, german jewelry export would increase further so in this background let us quickly go through what is uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreement and then we'll also see about india's uh, german jewelry sector See first what is comprehensive economic partnership agreement or sepa it is the free trade agreement between two countries see it is a type of trade agreement that covers services and investment and even other areas of economic partnership it may even covers areas such as trade facilitation and customs cooperation competition and intellectual property rights now this sepa also looks into the regulatory side of trade and it includes an agreement that covers all these problems So on those lines India is going to sign a sepa with uh, UAE and now let us see about uh, India's gem and jewelry sector from the export perspective today see as you know Indians always have a fondness for precious stones and jewelry and thereby they are the major collectors of these precious stones and jewelry so traditionally trade secrets of the jewelry business have been handed down over generations which has ensured the continuity of the traditional craft of making jewelry as a result today India is the world's largest diamond cutting and polishing center actually according to the available data in the financial year 2021 22 until october india actually exported gems and jewelry worth 23.65 billion us dollars this is comparatively more if you see the previous year records because previous year we exported gems and jewelry worth 11.4 billion us dollars Apart from this also note that India ranks first among the top exporters in cut and polished diamonds and uh, India is second in position in gold jewelry uh, silver jewelry and lab grown diamonds now especially the indian gems and jewelry sector is one of the largest in the world actually it contributes to around 29 percentage to the global jewelry consumption and this sector also employs over 4.64 million employees and it is home to over 3 lakh gems and jewelry players Now coming to the data for the last year according to the data from uh, Gem and Jewelry Export Promotion Council during the period April 2021 to January 2022 Gem and Jewelry exports have increased by around 70 percentage because as you can see here last year it was worth only 19.14 billion US dollars but now it is 32.37 billion US dollars So in this regard let us know the top 10 export destinations for India in the gem and jewelry sector these destinations include USA Hong Kong UAE Belgium Israel Thailand Singapore Netherlands United Kingdom and Japan and among them as you can see here US accounts for nearly 1/4 of our country's total gem and jewelry export so in this way this sector that is gem and jewelry sector contributes 7% to the GDP of our country So to further promote the sector government is taking uh, many number of initiatives and one such initiative is permitting 100% FDI in this sector under the automatic route. So these are the few facts that is relevant from prelims perspective regarding the gem and jewelry sector of India especially from the exports angle. So with these facts in mind now let us get to the next discussion which is the practice questions discussion session. So now before taking up the questions I have two news articles which I am not going to discuss in detail. This news article is from the text and context page. As you know, text and context almost explains major facts relevant to a topic. Now this particular one talks about coral bleaching and this is in reference to Australia's uh, Great Barrier Reef. So what you have to do is read this article and take note of important points and go and revise about Great Barrier Reef also. So it is difficult for us to cover all the important news articles in a day. So I'm just going to tell you what you should note from this article. First you have to note what are coral reefs, then what do we mean by bleaching? 
how it occurs or what are all the causes and if possible also note down the points in the context of how to prevent coral bleaching and then note the facts relevant to great barrier reef such as uh, where it is located how significant it is for australia etc etc now on the same lines you have this second extend context article it talks about microplastics if you remember just 4 to 5 days before we talked about a brand audit report of 2021 in which we saw about the plastic pollution especially the plastic wastes and on that day we discussed about uh, multilayered plastics low density polyethylene that is ldp and then hdp high density polyethylene but this particular article talks about microplastics in human blood so from this article what you have to note is the definition of microplastic and what are all the microplastics that are found in blood especially it talks about the pet that is polyethylene terephthalate and then finally note down what are all the possible health impacts because of uh, plastics in human blood now since both these articles are quite elaborative i did not cover it today and if time permits in my next class i might cover one of these articles so now let us take up the first question in the practice question discussion session now this first question asks which of the following are the creative fields covered by the unesco creative cities network first one crafts and folk arts then film gastronomy literature and then peace we know that uh, unesco creative cities network covers seven fields but peace is not one among them the remaining three are media arts design and then music so five should not be an answer and 1 2 3 and 4 are correct so the correct answer to this question is option d 1 2 3 and 4 only now let us take up this next question it is a two statement question first statement is the constitution has not specified the classes of citizens who are to be called the socially and educationally backward classes that is the statement says constitution does not define who are socially and educationally backward classes this statement is correct because constitution does not specify who are to be called as scbcs now let us take up the second statement unlike in the case of scheduled castes scheduled tribes and other backward classes the constitution has defined the persons who belong to the anglo indian community see just now we saw that scbcs are not defined and they include uh, the scheduled castes scheduled tribes and other backward classes so scbcs are not defined but anglo indians have been defined under the constitution according to article 366 anglo indian means a person whose father or any of whose other male progenitors in the male line is of european descent or was of european descent so statement 2 is also correct and here the question asks us to choose the correct statement so correct answer is option c both 1 and 2 so with these two practice questions let us take up this mains question for today interested aspirants can write answer to this question and post the answer in the comment section and whenever we'll get time we'll review your answer so with this we have come to the end of today's hindi news analysis sessions if you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and also subscribe to shankar ai's academy youtube channel for receiving regular updates thank you